Cool Academy Podcast listeners, this is episode 118, so 118, and today I'm talking to Pam and Andre Christy Smith. They are based in South Africa and are farming on a sheep farm there in sixth generation, with their son already being the seventh generation, as they will explain during the interview as well. And it was, yeah, another interview that uh, was initiated through the Will Connect conference by the Schneider Group. So I'm really happy uh, to have found some really interesting new uh, guests for the show. And I do hope you enjoy this podcast with Pam and Andre Christy Smith as well. Bye for now. Well, thank you, Pam for, and Andre, for your time today. It's really lovely to uh, be speaking from Northern Europe all the way to the, you say, the most Southern tip of Africa is where you're based. So thank you so much for being with me here on the show. I hope you're well. Thank you for your time. Yes, looking forward to the chat. <laughs> Great. Well, maybe I already mentioned you, you are in the most southern tip of Africa is where you're based. So tell me a little bit about your farm and like where you're based, uh, what you farm on your, on your property, etc. Um, we're a seventh generation on and we mostly farm, um, it's not a stud, it's just a flock. And we're one of the oldest commercial merino farms in South Africa. The sheep that came from Spain to the um, Prince of Orange were sent down to the Cape Colony because the Netherlands isn't really a great sheep farming country. And Michiel van Breda, who was one of the colonists in those days, had a farm out here called Zuttendal's Flay. And he's actually the guy who started Bredaasdorp, which is the town closest to us. And our farm was part of that. In fact, he, um, my great-grandmother was a van Breda. And she farmed. And her husband was the district surgeon, the doctor for the district. And um, well, the rest they say is, is history. We're the only ones of the Zuttendal farms that are still farming merinos. So you could kind of say we're, we're the only ones left here in this, in this area of the, the Zuttendal's flay bunch. The, the others have all branched out into other We are, what, the sixth generation on the farm now already? Seventh. Well, Jim's the seventh. Jim's the yeah. seventh. Yeah, our son, who's now nine, will be the seventh generation. And all he wants to do is farm, so that's quite a good thing. Excellent. How did you do that, that he's so convinced that he wants to farm as well? He was born with a tractor in his hand, uh -huh. somehow. <laughs> it was a very difficult birth. <laughs> yeah, and, and tell, so you only farm merino sheep, or do you also do other things on your farm? We have merino sheep, and we have Sussex cattle, um, and we are crop farming as well. Um, look at the farms, 4,700 hectares, uh, of which 1,200 is arable. Is marshland and natural felt. Um, it's been converted. Uh, uh, prior. The main farm is sheep. It's uh, wool farming is our main thing. Um, being merinos, it's what we, we focus on. And the rest, the reason we do crop farming is to put in pastures for the sheep. Um, obviously, it's cash crops. So we do wheat, or we do barley, we do oats, we do triticale. Um, Occasionally, oil seed rape or canola, as we call it, um, but it's mainly all geared to sheep farming. Okay. And obviously, merinos. And tell me a little bit about, um, like, you, you know, what is so? If I don't know anything about South Africa, like, what is the landscape like? Is it very, you know, do you have a lot of rainfall? Um, how do I <laughs> should I imagine? Uh, 
your farm? Um, is it very it's, green it's or dry? Very, <laughs> it's very, very diverse. Uh, depending on where you are in the country, we have arid to semi-arid to almost tropical conditions, depending on which part of the country we're in. We're in a very mild area. Um, so our average long term is 450 millimeters a year. Um, the last three or four years, we've been very far below average, um, up to only a third of our average at times. Um, but it's uh, our area particularly is a very mild, um, it's one of the mildest climates in the, in the world. Um, we don't get snow, we don't get frost very often. Um, we have a winter rainfall area, so hot, dry summers, cold, well, for us cold, wet winters. Um, <laughs> not as cold as Europe, of course, but uh, we feel very cold. Sort of 15 degree cold, not, not where you guys are. Yeah, I mean, we shear our sheep in the middle of winter and we don't have shelter for them. They're out in the, in the land, but they don't die of cold. We don't have to worry about that. It's not minus 10 or minus 12 degrees. So it's, it's quite useful. Mm. And I, I, can I ask you, I know we have other questions lined up as well, but why, why, what is the reason for shearing in the winter then? Like what is the uh, benefits? I think the old theory was that if you shear in the winter, the sheep gets cold so the wool grows back quicker. Um, I don't know how true that is really. Um, but it fits in with our shearing schedule. We shear every six months, we shear our ewes, so they get shorn just before lambing, um, and then again, just before mating. So mm -hmm. it just so happens to be some of, one of those shears is gonna have to be in the winter. Um, but it, traditionally it was because the wool would grow back quicker in the winter, and it also, it's not that cold, so. We don't shear our lambs in winter. Mm -hmm. we've we shear them sort of we've we've just shown them now um because they're too little and having short wool on them isn't isn't beneficial for the lambs but the big sheep coat it's not that cold we complain that it's cold we don't have central heating in our houses <laughs> so it feels colder than it does in europe <laughs> yeah yeah no no but that okay so and mating is happen no like lambing is happening right now yeah Okay. Yeah, we'll I'll mate in um, in October for six weeks. So next week the rams come out, and then we lamb March or April, um, and then I'll wean June or July depending on conditions, um, and then we'll shear the lambs in in either October, October or November mm -hmm. or even sometimes December, just depending on conditions. Mm -hmm. We had fly strike problems this year, so we saw a bit earlier than I would have liked. Okay. Uh, but I also had to take in consideration we, it's harvesting time now as well, so you will try and squeeze in shearing in your harvesting and things. So mm. we delayed with the harvesting because of good rains and good weather, so I've done the shearing a bit earlier. Yeah. And tell me about that fly strike, like wh why? Is that common that you have sometimes issues with fly strike? It is common. Um, the whole world about the non-mulesing, uh, South Africa is completely non-mules. Um, we bred out the folds in the skin and we do, we have limited the fly strike quite a lot. Um, but the hotter, wetter times of the year, or if the sheep's got an upset stomach and, and the wool gets dirty around the bums and things, then we do have fly strike issues. It's not major. There are quite a few nice treatments available now. Um, certainly in South Africa, we've got one thing that works for four to five months, one application. Um, other things work up to 10 weeks, others for four to five weeks. It just depends on, on what you want to do. Um, and unfortunately this year, the one product didn't work as well as it it was supposed to have worked whether our application was wrong or the conditions were just too good for the fly strike. So mm. we had, and well, not a lot, it was four or five sheep. Um, mm. that so you monitor your sheep and then whenever you see like a fly strike, I guess, then, yeah. then you take care of it. Yeah, we treat, we, they'll be spot treated throughout the year. We get it sort of year round, we get one here, one there, nothing, nothing great. Um, and the older sheep tend to be slightly more 
I don't know immune is the right word, but they get resistant. less resistant to it. They get mm -hmm. less of it. It's more on the young sheep, the lambs and the two-year-olds that mm -hmm. tend to get it. Mm -hmm. um, but so one of the products that we put on, which I use on all my sheep, it's expensive, but it does work. It keeps flies away for five, up to six months at times. Mm -hmm. So it does help. And the shearing then helps in what sense? Like because you said you sheared earlier than you wanted? Uh, if there's no wool on the sheep or if the sheep's wool is very, very short, then the larvae don't have a place to hide. They don't have a, a warm, moist area to breed or mm -hmm. to grow. Okay. Um, and the, the sheep don't dirty themselves, don't dirty the backsides, mm -hmm. they don't get wet and nowhere to hide, which helps. Okay. Makes sense. And you, um, I actually found that quite interesting. One of your Instagram posts where you uh, posted a historic document with your sheep count from 1932. So um, I wasn't counting that. Uh, I wasn't there. <laughs> yeah. So what was the sheep count in 1932? Was... Sure. Let me have a look. I can't get my phone. Hold on. It was 232 sheep, I think, in total. And today, what's your sheep count today? Today, we're on currently 4,500 sheep. Mm -hmm. um, it varies between 4,500 and 6,500, just depending on season and lambs, etc. I just sold off 1,000 sheep. Um, so it would have been 5,500. Um, but that includes, we also farm with weathers. We're one of the few farms in the area that still farm with weathers. Uh, we call them Hummels. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> most people have their breeding ewes and, and their lambs. We I actually have almost more weathers than I have. Well, I do have more than weathers and breeding ewes. Um, I've got property that's conducive to expansive farming, um, extensive farming, and the weathers do very, very well. They don't have to be fed. They don't get medication as much. They don't need to be mothered as a ewe does and they produce the finest wool for us mm -hmm. okay. very useful Good. they get shorn less often than the ewes do so it's also longer finer wool mm -hmm. than the ewes produce because we don't have to worry about breeding times and lambing times we can sort of adjust mm -hmm. And was it common in 1932 to just have 200 like that small of a flock was that well, that's when my grandfather started out on this piece of farm. So I suspect it was where he, he, had, to build up, he had to build up from yeah. there. Yeah. When Machil von Breda was at the peak of the Merinos, um, starting out of the Merinos, he had up to 5,000 sheep yeah. on the farm. But the farm was, um, I want to lie to you and say it was 20,000 hectares. It was, it was absolutely massive. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the farms here have 1,000 to 1,500 to 2,000 breeding ewes. The really bigger farms around here might have 2,000 breeding ewes. Um, but then they don't keep their weathers. They sell their lambs at weaning. Mm -hmm. Okay. And sorry, I interrupted you earlier, Pam. You wanted to say something else. Couldn't have been very important. I can't remember I'm sorry. It was. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, actually, it took us a little bit of back and forth by email to find the date and, and now we're actually also meeting on a weekend and tell me a little bit because this week seemed quite stressful for you so maybe tell us a little bit what's happening <laughs> right now why it was so stressful and yeah, also <laughs> maybe what a typical day would look like for you uh, the, the week wasn't stressful per se um, I had to have our farm lorry had to go in the truck that carts the grain to town it needs its MOT, uh, so to speak. We have a road with the test that has to do every year. Um, but because of COVID and that, uh, the traffic department being a government business, of course, works as slowly as possible. Um, and they've used every excuse possible to do even less work. <laughs> so we get appointments and I had to, uh, and then the, there was a few problems with the lorry that they picked up, which passed the last few years. This year didn't pass. So I had to come back and fix those. Um, and then go back in again. And um, it is harvesting time. So we are cutting the crops. We cut into windrows and then 
pick up with a combine harvester. I know Europe does straight combining, which is way more exciting. Um, so we were cutting and because of the, we had the wool on auction on Wednesday, I was focused on the auction. I was, it's a Zoom auction, so it's a very similar Zoom meeting and you can sit and watch the wool and bite your nails and jump up for joy when it goes well. Um, so Wednesday, I was pretty much stuck with, with that. Tuesday, I was at, in town with the lorry and Thursday, I had to go to town again with the lorry. Um, so yeah, it's just a normal old, what always a fun. not telling you is all our neighbours started harvesting a week and a half ago. And because of weather conditions and our grain just not ripening as fast as theirs, he's been sitting watching the others work, which is never a good thing for a farmer. <laughs> so whether he realizes that or not, that's pretty stressful too. <laughs> yeah, no, I can imagine. It's just annoying. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I can imagine that you're always kind of worried and always need to think of what do I need to do to ensure a good harvest. And yeah, we've got the biggest stress is uh, rainfall in harvesting time. Um, and there was rain forecast for yesterday and today, and there's again tomorrow and things. So you always wonder, should you have tried earlier? But mm -hmm. it's got to be. We also, uh, in Europe, I know you can deliver grain at a much higher moisture content. Their drying capacities are much higher than ours, whereas in, in South Africa, grain has to be 13% moisture, which is basically bone dry. Mm -hmm. um, and anything up to 13.5% is fairly easy to dry, but from there on up, anything up to 14, 14 and a half percent becomes very expensive to dry and they actually don't accept it above 14 and a half percent. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, you wrote problems. to me, you can only continue sometime next week with, yeah. Hi. Yes, and because of the rain we had, we're thinking if the weather holds out nicely, then maybe by Wednesday or Thursday next week, we'll start again. Mm. Okay. But it gives me time to look after my sheep, so that's fine. Yeah, and tell me, what is like a typical day where you, with your sheep, when you get up, what do you do? Or what time do you get up? <laughs> uh, the farm starts at half past six in the morning. So I get up at 25 past six, usually. <laughs> Luckily, <laughs> I don't have to commute to work. Um, but everybody starts at half past six, and um, we finish at half past five, but we have two half hour breaks and an hour lunch break during the course of the day. Um, Generally speaking, I've got three shepherds, three guys that are involved in, in the sheep side. And then I've got three guys that are on the mechanical side, the tractor drivers and fencing and that kind of thing. Um, typical day, the shepherds go out through all the stock. Um, in the quiet time, sort of between lambing and all that, they'll go around all the stock every second day. Um, just, I mean, it's quite quite large, 2,000 hectares to cover. It takes, takes a while. Um, during lambing, they go around every day. In fact, we go around twice a day um, in the peak lambing season. Um, at the moment, I don't need to feed because it's just been spring and there's a lot of food in the land. We are giving a bit of supplementary feed just because the rams are in. It just helps a bit. So they go around Monday, Wednesday, Friday. They check all water troughs, check for... Um, We call it foot wiki. Um, it's just the, the hoof foot rots, the hooves get infected, or if the ground's very damp, it gets foot rot, or we have a thing called the double key, which is a very spiky thorn that lives on the ground, mm -hmm. uh, which gets in there. So then they will get, become lame and cripple, and they go through every day and just check each flock. If it's a cripple one, they will either remove the thorn, if it's a thorn, or treat if it sticks and they will get an injection just to help them along. Um, and they will go check water troughs, make sure the troughs are clean. All our water is borehole water, um, but it's very, very brackish. We're 20 miles from the sea, so the water is very nearly seawater. The stock do drink it, which is <laughs> very lucky because there's no other water. Around here. We don't have um, pipe so um, they will make sure all crops are, um, and the other guy spraying the crops then they will drive around checking fences making sure there's no holes in fences or posts broken and we chop out any thistles 
that we have the Scottish thistle is a bit of a pest with us. We have a thing called the butter boss, um, which is a, also sort of a thorny bush, but gets stuck in the wall and it's very hard to get removed from the wall. So they go around manually chopping them out. Uh, and that's kind of their, their day. Okay, and that maybe leads me to my next question. Um, I'm actually, your very, very first Instagram post was a photo of your sheep in the green paddock. And then you, your comment was happy sheep. And that's- Didn't they my, look happy to you? Yes, they did. <laughs> but I think, you know, consumers are very concerned that sheep are happy. And it's also like the animal welfare movement is moving away from doing you know avoid doing damage to the sheep but actually ensuring mm. that sheep are happy and yes, you know. yes. so i want so how do we define a happy sheep so from <laughs> your farmer's perspective how do you know that your sheep are happy sheep need food and they need water and if it's the weather conditions are such then they need shelter our and sheep space. yes and they need space they need to be free to roam um so those sheep were particularly in a camp that had, we, we plant a lot of lucerne. So they were in almost to my knee high lucerne. So they had food. There was obviously water in the camp. So they had water and it was a lovely sunny day. They, I mean, they were just happy. Um, we try very hard to, I mean, our sheep obviously must not suffer. Um, they must not go hungry and they must never not have water. Um, we don't, bring our sheep in in winter. Um, so it looks like it's harsh, but the conditions aren't so bad. And we all know the properties of wool that it keeps you cool in summer and warm in winter. Yeah. So you know, they've got the ideal clothing for, for outside. Um, but as far as we're concerned, the sheep mustn't be suffering anyway. So we look for fly strike. Those were all treated, so we know they didn't have those. They were, they were healthy, they weren't sick. They didn't have sore feet, which is a big problem at times. Um, and the picture just, I mean, they were bleating and they were happy. So <laughs> it got posted. Yeah, no, that's what I maybe also like do, like is it when sheep, if they are quiet and just munching along or can you also see like their behavior if they're like stressed or if they're relaxed? You can, yes. It's um, it's just, you, you pick it up from in a camp if, if you, Certainly in, in the drier months, when we're feeding every day because there really isn't food around, if you drive into the far, into the land with the vehicle, the sheep start running towards the vehicle because they know you've got food in the back of the vehicle for them. Uh, that's It has to happen, I understand, but it's not that's nice seeing it. Um, whereas that particular picture, we were still giving them supplements because we have a very low copper, for, as an example, in our area. So they get supplements year round um but we just top up the bowls and the sheep would sort of look up at you oh yes you're here well done and carry on grazing <laughs> um so that's the ideal thing um now as well while the rams are in um it's nice to drive through and see that the whole flock is together yeah um my flocks are 200 250 strong with uh, we work on three rams per hundred um, I know Australia work on one ram per hundred sheep. I don't know if those guys work hard. Um, so, uh, but so it's not, it's not very many rams, but it's 250, 300 sheep. And they're all together in the middle of the land, grazing away. They don't come running to the troughs. Um, and they just, they're content. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think on a, on a large scale, you judge your happiness of your sheep by your statistics. Unhappy sheep aren't going to have lambing percentages that are ideal. They're not going to have weaning percentages that are ideal. Just if you take it to a small level, if you're a malnourished person, you're less likely to fall pregnant and less likely to have a normal, happy, healthy pregnancy and healthy baby. And the same thing applies to animals. Mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense i like how you explained that yeah that's what that's why i keep it on you see yeah <laughs> and also i guess i mean a lot of people are wool growers also say a happy sheep produces healthy strong wool so yes. you would also see it if, in they're, quality. if they're too stressed then you get a break in the wool and then obviously your wool is shorter and less ideal mm -hmm. so um yeah it's 
it's quite an easy it's hard to measure emotion in an animal but it's an easy thing to measure the overall well-being of the animal and how they're actually doing mm. statistically on mass as well as individually and our shepherds especially our main shepherd has been with us for 20 almost 21 years and he can see at a glance when a sheep as you say isn't happy yeah he might not necessarily be able to diagnose the problem immediately but he does pick up straight away that there's one or two of them that aren't fitting in with the flock and aren't doing well and then they obviously need to be treated yeah and, and they know the sheep well because in in some times of doing the year they see them twice a day so yes yes yeah no <laughs> yeah yeah no, you yeah and um, yeah, so this was more of a, how do you know, but you also are RWS certified, for example. So yeah. you also have, uh, you know, kind of the paperwork to prove uh, a high animal welfare. What made you decide to become RWS certified? Uh, it's kind of a no brainer, really. Um, if you want to produce, oh, look, we produce some of the finest wool around, which is useful to have, um, but so do a lot of other people. Um, and currently, one of the ways of getting more for your wool is by being RWS certified. Um, and personally, we on this farm, we agree with RWS. We agree with certain standards. We used to work on the code of best practice as set out by um, Cape Wools, mm -hmm. um, which is a very similar thing, but not quite as in-depth. Um, because we agree, we sheep need to be happy. We can go back to the happy sheep again. Yeah. But we agree with that, and we we agree that um, the land isn't property, isn't ours. It belongs to the next generation. So if we can look after it, and RWS does have in there your land management and that kind of stuff, which we were doing anyway. We're looking after the land. We and if we can do that now then the next generation gets a better property. And if they can do that, they'll get a better. And RWS fits in with that. Um, we also like the idea of traceable wool. Um, plus it gives you an extra 10 or 15%, which is a real bonus. Yeah. We were doing most of the stuff anyway. So if you do the certification, then you get recognition for what you were doing anyway. Mm -hmm. My um, My parents, my mother particularly is a conservationist. She's a botanist by training. So, whether the, you know, the previous generations didn't spell things out the way we do now, but um, they tried to farm in such a way that the land and the natural felt doesn't suffer and the botanical felt doesn't suffer. Um, and to have it on paper just means that somebody else has recognized that that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of like a lot of critique for certifications like RWS is that it's a lot of paperwork and it's an extra burden and extra cost. Did you feel that it was complicated or like? There were a few issues. One of which um, South African labour um, aren't the most highly educated. Case in point, my shepherd can't read or write. Mm -hmm. He's a brilliant shepherd, but he's illiterate. So that did cause problems because I'm not with my sheep all the time. I've got other things to do as well. So I can't always be there. So there are record keeping issues that we do have. Um, but we have a good communication line. And if something changes, it lets me know and we do record it. Mm -hmm. So that the main main um We've always done what needs to be done for our WS, just been having to prove it mm -hmm. is difficult. Mm -hmm. um, one, one thing that I have found, I use an app um, from a company in the UK, um, which is very, very good. It's called Field Margin, and re you can record everything on it. Um, so that has made things a lot easier. The shepherds, I've got an assistant in who can work that, um, and it ties in nicely with your land management, your grazing management, um, and your stock management. You can tie it all together in one very easy location. So that definitely has helped. Mm -hmm. But I think some farmers might struggle with the paperwork required. It's not a lot of paperwork required, to be honest. Um, farmers aren't traditionally good at admin. 
Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's more hands on. Admin. Yeah, it's, we want to be out there, not in here. Yeah, <laughs> it requires a lot of admin, but once you've got the initial paperwork in place, it's um, the maintenance isn't that labor intensive. But for us, it is a bit of a problem because our main, call it the brains of our shepherding operation, can't, I mean, he can't write his name. So he can't fill in spreadsheets and records and mm -hmm. he, he can tell you where they are and when last they were done but we need the proof mm -hmm. and that's the problem okay right. so you had to work around a little bit mm -hmm. yeah but mm -hmm. we've got that sorted now so mm -hmm. it's, yeah and it wasn't too difficult to do and i think if you've got somebody who's slightly more tech savvy um certainly the younger farmers and people my age and things for them it, it actually isn't that difficult and i didn't really struggle to get the rwa certification mm -hmm. okay and um now I forgot one of my questions. Okay, it's but no, sorry, yeah. Um, <laughs> and I also saw uh, that you only recently started like an Instagram account and a Facebook account. What made you decide uh, to start communicating? We were interviewed by one of the South African agricultural magazines in February, March, February, February. 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 And the first comment the journalist made was that we have no internet presence. It is quite tricky and expensive to set up a website. And since we don't sell things directly off the farm, we wouldn't get any real marketing benefit from a website. Instagram is a cheap and easy way of having an internet presence without having to go through all that schlep. So that's the basic crux of it also shortly after the interview i had a friend of mine visit from the uk and she works for herself a company called moor in felt she does felting with natural uh, with, with indigenous uk sheep um, has a little shop and she does she works, works in a place called the wool clip in um, cambria um, and obviously a lot of their stuff is advertised via Instagram, Facebook, that kind of stuff. And she sort of said, to me, why don't I have an Instagram account? So while she was here, I sort of half jokingly quickly opened up an Instagram account. So we'd see, we do have one. Um, and then, of course, from there, started posting onto it. And it's just the idea is for it to grow, obviously, a lot more. Um, we, we like our story that we've got, uh, the farm story, our wool story, the family that's you know, six generations and it's a nice way to actually get the story out there it was also in the middle of lockdown so you see a lot of the posts are sunrises and sunsets and outdoor pictures also just letting our friends in the cities and things you know this is what we've got what have you got it was sort of <laughs> almost done as a as a joke almost and it actually became a very very useful tool to have yeah a lot of our friends who have nothing to do with sheep or farming or have actually followed the Clayable Trust Instagram just simply so that because our lockdown in South Africa was extreme for the first five weeks you weren't allowed outside the house except for shopping and medical visits so those people were getting cabin fever on and magnificent scale and it gave them a chance to just see the outside world and see that the sun is still shining somewhere even if they haven't experienced it themselves for a while. So. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And and not even during lockdown, I think in general, you know, there's a ever growing larger urban population that is losing the, the direct connection with nature. So for them, it's also a way to reconnect and, and understand what what uh, rural life and, and agriculture is. It, it does. It's not just the urban population um when our son was in grade r which is pre-primary um my husband took some sheep to school to show the children and i mean we're in a small town completely surrounded by sheep farms and the number of kids who'd never seen a sheep up close and personal it was absolutely frightening and one of the children actually asked him how he dressed the wool onto the sheep <laughs> um in terms of is it a jersey 
So I think a large portion of the world is losing touch of where their food and their consumer items come from. You know, milk and wool jerseys come from the shops. They don't realize, they might know in an abstract sense that it's coming from cows and sheep, but they don't actually understand the real fundamentals of the fact that farm equals food. Um, so yeah. it's, yeah, I, I think that's part of the whole traceability and sustainability as we want people to realize where their things are coming from and make better choices. Um, and make sure that the farmers are making better choices. Yeah, the exactly. Yeah, so good job on getting started on that one as well. <laughs> And uh, yeah, we actually uh, started to connect and have this interview today because you were also uh, attending the Wool Connect conference uh, in the beginning of October. So tell me a little bit, what did you learn and take away from that conference? The reason I wanted to join the conference is exactly what I've found from the conference. Sustainability and traceability is becoming more and more of a an issue. I think, unfortunately, it's still obviously with the high-end products. Um, it's not going to come down, filter through to the general consumer just yet. Um, but more and more people are being more are more aware of it and are asking questions about it now, which is which is what we'd like to see. Um, and what I'd like to see um, one of the companies I looked at this week is called Sheep Included. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're a UK company, um, and I don't know if you know who they are at all. Um, I'm not sure. Are when you buy a jersey from them, yeah. if you buy a jersey from them, they have a little scanner on the jersey, which links straight to a sheep in New Zealand. They've got an RFID tag in the ear, and you can go online and find out exactly where the sheep is, um, what it's been fed, what it's been, the whole history of that particular sheep based on the jersey that you've purchased. Um, now I don't think South Africa is quite there just yet. We have the same quality wool as New Zealand does, um, raised in the same way, um, but I don't think the wool producing world is quite aware how nice South African wool is and how wonderful it really is. And we're trying to, me personally, we're trying to get South Africa's name out there. Obviously, if they take my wool, it'd be really a bonus, but okay. in general, getting South Africa's name give us a better name in the in the wool buying circles um, and I think that conference was quite nice for me as a general con uh, producer just to see what the manufacturers or the processes are looking for and where they are sort of well where they're heading, yeah. No, no, I agree. And what Wool Connect was also about is actually, I think one of the things that came out of it is that we have to more often connect along the supply chain and talk to each other. What do you think would be important? Like what topic do you think from a wool growers perspective, we should talk and discuss more and work more together within our supply oh. chain? Case in point was this week when my will was an auction. Um, I personally feel there's a very big gap between the producer and the jumper you're wearing at the moment. Um, there's a lot that has to happen to get it there. Um, and the general consensus is the farmer works very hard up until the wool shed gets the wool shorn into a bale onto a lorry and it goes off to the off to market. He then has absolutely no say in his wool whatsoever anymore until he gets his wool check. Um, and I think there's a big communication gap there. Um, Pam's cousin happens to be a buyer for standard wool. Um, so we have a family connection with one of the buyers. And I, generally speaking, chat to him and to other buyers, not regularly, but fairly regularly. And he actually said to me that this week, China has to fulfill South African wool orders. So he knew that my wool was in store and he said, put your wool on auction this week. This is the best week available. And that kind of communication as a starting point, I think the farmers need. And because I 
happen to know who the buyer was, he was family, we have this connection, but the other farmers don't. Um, my neighbor had her wool, it left here the same day as my wool. Um, and she wasn't made aware of that. And the wool is still sitting in the mm -hmm. shed. Um, or she sold it three weeks ago and didn't hold it back. Um, so I definitely think there's a big gap in communication there. Um, and even further along the lines, the, the spinners, the guys that wash the wool, all those departments um, don't really communicate back to the farmer. It's as simple as why do some lines get higher prices than others? Obviously, there's something that the factories are looking for that we're not necessarily producing. Now, we don't have a total control over the fiber that gets produced, but if you know that there's a certain length that is better for them, then you would obviously shear closer to that length. It's one of the reasons why we started sharing every six months, whereas my father shore every year. Um, so we were getting these magnificently long fibers and it was only when my cousin started buying and he said, look, we can't do anything with those long fibers. The machines can't use them. Nobody said anything before that. So um, it's obviously useful to have the inside connection, but, I th but it shouldn't be about who you know it should actually be part of the whole process yeah exactly yeah oh that's a really insightful uh, thanks for sharing that yeah, what we are getting is um we've got sort of whatsapp groups and things and there's one here called the bradars wool group um so but my, most of the wool producers are on the group um, we get a lot of information about Australia. Our market follows Australia's market. Their auction is Tuesday, third Wednesday. We are on Wednesday. So we, and obviously they're ahead of us. So we have sort of 12 hours notice of what the market conditions are like. Mm -hmm. um, so we are getting that information for which we can then use on a weekly basis for our auctions. But that's kind of just purely on today's market. It's not really a overall... And it doesn't not necessarily just have to be about the market. It's sort of the wool industry as a whole. Um, the Wool Connect, there were a lot of things there that I knew about because I'm interested in it, but nobody else knew about any of that stuff. And it's we should, we as producers should be made aware of all the options that are available. Um, my dream is to have people, I don't know, what would it be like Zenga or Armed Angels or one of those, come out to the farms of Africa, see what we've got. Um, but I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. I think they're also very scared of our politics because it's we're very, um, well, I think even the Americans are more stable than we are at the moment with their, uh, with their elections. So that is a bit of a problem for us. Um, but I did enjoy the Wool Connect because it gave you insight into the other side of the coin almost, sort of mm. what's happening further down the line and what... So we can adapt to a point to the market. There are ways that we can, like say, with shearing, changing the, the shearing schedule and stuff. Um, and to breeding, you can breed, I guess, obviously not an overnight thing, but you can breed your, your, your wool finer, coarser, longer, thinner. Mm -hmm. um, there are things that one can do. Um, there's a very strong push in South Africa at the moment for RFID tags. Um, they're trying very hard to get a lot of that in. It's very, very expensive. Um, if I were to Im implement it on just on my use, it'd be 200,000 Rand. Oh, okay. Mm. Um, which um, for converting to euros probably isn't, isn't an awful lot of money, but uh, for me, it's, it's- Still, it's an investment, yeah. It's an adjustment. And currently the, re the return on investment, um, the guy selling the tag obviously tells you you get it back within a year or two, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I haven't seen Proof that that's quite the case just yet. So there's things that are moving along, um, but I think the the gap between buyer and seller is still a little bit large. There's also there's a lot of other certifications out there that we sort of come up, stumble across accidentally through Instagram and through these um, the campaign for wool and you know those sort of sites. And 
one doesn't know what value they have, you know, is RWS enough or should one be looking into those other forms of paperwork as well? When, like you said, you don't want an unnecessary paperwork la labor, but if it's going to change who is buying and what they're buying, then we need to know about it, but they're not talking to us. So, you know, even RWS, we found out by accident. Yeah. Okay. Um, Nobody was saying we would prefer you to have this and could you please make a plan? Mm. Um. Yeah. Okay, but that's really helpful. And I agree. Um, I think whenever, you know, we like retailers or have the chance of visiting a, a farm, it changes their perspective tremendously. And we did hear that also throughout the conference um, that some brands, for example, I, I asked that particularly think to to the guys from Muji they yes. I asked them so what what do you get I asked them before the conference why do you you know what do you get out of these conferences uh, out of visiting sheep farmers and they said yeah it always opens our eyes and helps us you know develop a product better and come up with new ideas and better understand and and I think Willy Gallia said the same that he was bringing a lot of um, brands also to Argentina to better understand farming there. So I think that's definitely something, um, yeah, to explore even more. Mm. And, um, but what I may, now I remember what I wanted to ask you uh, uh, earlier is uh, not ask, but also just state, and this interview made that clear again that for sheep farmers like yourselves, you are like, I, I find, I always say you're like heroes because you have to. I think I understood that you had to actually repair your truck by yourself, right? So you're like a mechanic. Oh, so it is. <laughs> yeah, no, and then obviously you take care of sheep, you have to watch the weather, you have to understand crops, you know, you have to uh, organize, you have to file paperwork, uh, watch markets, understand business dynamics. So I think it's it's unbelievable all the different things that, that wool growers like yourself have to do. Um, Never a dull moment on the farm. Yeah, exactly. There's and a lot you have of to labor do management as well. Yeah, well, that's the fun part. <laughs> There's a lot of labor management yeah. as well. Yeah, exactly. People in yeah, HR. Mm. Our, and our HR is, um, you know, they, they live on the farm with us. So it's not just when they clock in for work and when they clock out. It's their general health and well being. And there's a lot of socioeconomic implications attached to having people living on your property, um, yeah. especially when they're not necessarily that educated. Mm. Um, so we, we do try very hard, but it gets a bit frustrating sometimes. Yeah, yeah. We were all lucky in South Africa is the labor is very, very cheap. Um, mm -hmm. Not that we underpay our staff, um, but minimum wages and hourly rates and because the labor is un not untrained but unskilled at times they don't have qualifications um they don't demand high wages and they, they, they can't demand high wages um so we are lucky in that i've got my farm's got six or seven staff members varies between sometimes five and um but I can afford it because it's not expensive labor. Australia, New Zealand, the farmer has to do it all himself with the wife and the four kids. Um, so that does help us. We can look after our things better because we've got the labor. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I joked with you earlier that I sit on the strip and, uh, and, and drink coffee a lot, uh, <laughs> which is the, the idea a lot of people have as South African farmers that we do that because we have all the labor, we can do that. So every four o'clock is coffee time, just by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is important, but I, yes. from what you said uh, today, I don't believe that you do that all day. <laughs> try well, not to. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Pam and Andrew, uh, Andre, for for taking the time and and answering all my detailed questions, which were not uh, pre-shared with you. So, but I thought it was really really interesting. Thank and, you very um, much for your time. Yeah. Thank you, and yeah, lots of future luck for you and your farm and your family and when the world opens up again please come and visit us i will for sure i've been to south <laughs> africa already a few times and i really love it and enjoy it there so we have a very very beautiful beach close by it's quite a well-kept secret so okay well <laughs> it might not be anymore now <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
There's plenty of space on us, don't worry. It's a huge <laughs> beach here. <laughs> Great. Great yeah, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Well, I do hope you enjoyed this interview. And I thought it was really, really interesting to hear about the motivation that Pam and Andre have and all the different uh, tasks that are involved in running their sheep farm. If you want to find out more, then head on over to the show notes at elizabethvandelden.com forward slash 118. And I will also link to the social media accounts that we've talked about of Pam and Andre. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed this episode and I see you again in two weeks time. Thanks and bye for now. <laughs>